The problem of the stability of the solar system is one of the oldest problems in theoretical physics and one of the simplest ones to state. It goes back to Isaac Newton, uh, and Newton formulated his universal law of gravity that says that all objects attract one another with a gravitational force. He also formulated his laws of motion, and with the combination of those two laws, he was able to explain uh, the motion of the planets. In particular, he was able to solve exactly the two-body problem for the motion of one planet uh, going around the sun. He was able to show that the orbit of one planet was an ellipse with one focus uh, on the sun. The trouble is that the solar system has more than one planet. Uh, and because of the law of universal gravity, each planet attracts all of the other planets. That turns the problem from the simple two-body problem into an n-body problem. And that problem is one that Newton wasn't able to solve. Because the, the masses of the planets are small compared to the mass of the sun, the biggest planet, Jupiter, is only a thousandth of the mass of the sun. The extra forces from the other planets are rather small. And so you can approximately calculate the solution to the n-body problem by looking at small perturbations, small changes in the orbit say, of uh, the Earth due to the gravitational influence of Jupiter. The trouble with that is that the solar system is very old. Uh, the Earth has gone around the Sun already four and a half thousand million times, and before the Sun dies, it'll go around for another seven or eight thousand billion. And the question that Newton couldn't figure out the answer to is over very long periods, over thousands of millions of orbits, do these small periodic uh, kicks in the orbit of uh, the Earth due to Jupiter, do they cancel out or do they add up? That is, if you follow the motion of the Earth for a very long time, does it gradually become more and more irregular, say more and more eccentric, or do these periodic uh, extra forces from Jupiter just cause periodic variations in the Earth, Earth orbit with the orbit staying more or less the same? felt that the answer to this was that the solar system was unstable. We believe he thought that the gravita extra gra periodic gravitational forces from Jupiter would cause the orbit of the Earth to gradually become more and more eccentric until eventually it fell into the sun or collided with another planet or was ejected into interstellar space. However, this point of view that Newton had was not something he could prove. And it was, turns out it was tied up in a complicated way with Newton's theology, because Newton believed that God had a continuing role in the, uh, in the way that life uh, carries on in the universe. And he believed that uh, God's intervention was necessary to keep the solar system running smoothly. This point of view wasn't shared by all of his contemporaries. For example, Leibniz, who lived at the same time and had a controversy with Newton over the, the invention of calculus, uh, believed that, the so that God had created a perfect solar system which could run forever without intervention. And uh, Leibniz famously said that uh, uh, Mr. Newton's uh, God seemed it was not able to make a watch that would run forever, that, the, that Newton's God made a watch that had to go in for, for servicing from, from time to time. Apart from the theology, over the several hundred years since Newton, many of the world's most famous uh, mathematicians and physicists have tried to solve the problem of the stability of the solar system. There is a long list, uh, including uh, uh, Poincaré, uh, Poisson, Laplace, uh, Lagrange, and in more recent times, the, the Russian physicists Kolmogorov and uh, the mathematician uh, Arnold. What they were able to prove is that in certain very restricted senses, uh, the solar system was stable. That is, if, if you had an artificial solar system in which the masses of the planets were extremely small, the orbits were very nearly circular, you could uh, prove uh, analytically that the, the system was stable forever. But this doesn't help with understanding the actual stability of the solar system because the planetary masses, although small compared to the sun, are much larger than, needed for, uh, than these people needed for the theorems that they proved. 
So the problem remained unsolved until, uh, until the 1980s and 1990s. Um, at that point, um, it was realized that the only way to solve the problem was direct numerical calculations. And the computers had begun to become fast enough that it was feasible to actually numerically follow thousands of millions of orbits like the, um, like the actual age of the solar system. Uh, this is practical because the solar system is really an isolated system. We, the distance from the uh, sun to the nearest star is a couple of hundred thousand times the distance from the sun to the earth. Occasionally stars come pass by, but not very closely. Um, in addition, as a result of space missions and ground-based observations, we now know the masses of the planets very well. We know the current orbits of the planets very well. And so in principle, all you have to do is to plug those values, those numbers that we know, uh, into a computer code with the equations of motion that uh, Newton derived with small corrections for Einstein's theory of relativity, which we also understand very well, and then just follow the orbits uh, for a few thousand million years either into the future or the past to see what happens. This became practical once uh, the clock speeds uh, on uh, uh, computer CPUs became fast enough, and once uh, applied mathematicians had derived numerical algorithms that were able to follow these uh, efficiently and stably for the rather demanding task of uh, thousands of millions of orbits. In fact, the technology for doing this hasn't really improved uh, uh, since about 2000 because most of the the improvement in computer, computer power has been as a result of parallelization. And this is a problem that you can't parallelize. That is, you can't divide up the task among many different processors. You can't compute what the solar system will do uh, from 2 billion years to 3 billion years until you know where it is after 2 billion years. This has now been done. Uh, we've now followed the solar system. Uh, until its death and followed it back until the time of its origin. Uh, all the planets are still there. Uh, the orbits look more or less the same. Uh, nothing has fallen into the sun, nothing has escaped. Um, nevertheless, the results have turned out to be interesting and surprising. Uh, the reason for the, the surprise and the interest has to do with the nature of dynamical systems. In general, there are two types of dynamical systems. Uh, regular systems and chaotic systems. Regular systems are highly predictable. Um, chaotic systems are unpredictable. The simplest examples of regular and chaotic systems comes from uh, sports. So for example, the reason golf is a uh, feasible game is because the trajectory of a golf ball is very regular. It's highly predictable. Mathematically, it says that uh, the definition of regularity is that small changes in the trajectory of the, the golf ball increase linearly. That is, if your shot is off by a centimeter uh, after 100 meters, it'll be off two centimeters after 200 meters, three centimeters after 300 meters, and so forth. In contrast, the chaotic system, small changes grow exponentially. So if the if uh, your trajectory is off by uh, a centimeter after 100 meters, then it will be two centimeters, four centimeters, eight centimeters, and so forth. Small changes diverge exponentially. The classic example of a uh, chaotic system is the weather. We can predict the weather uh, very well over uh, small intervals, but over uh, longer intervals, the weather is essentially unpredictable because it's a chaotic system. Uh, other examples from sports and games, billiards uh, are uh, bank shots involving several balls are uh, very difficult because the system is chaotic. Small changes uh, multiply every time you uh, hit another ball. Uh, baseball, the, the, the aim of the pitcher is to make his pitch as chaotic and unpredictable as possible and so forth. Typically with a, a chaotic system, particularly if it's only weakly chaotic, it will appear to be regular uh, for some time. The trajectory, any change in trajectories will uh, grow linearly and then eventually the chaos 
takes off and the changes start to grow exponentially. The surprise that physicists had when they began to do long calculations of the solar system is that it was chaotic. That is, the orbits of the planets were chaotic. They found that if they made a small change in the uh, position, say, of Jupiter when they started the calculation, eventually uh, the difference between the original system and the changed system would start to grow exponentially. The strength of the chaos is measured by a, a quantity called the Lyapunov time, uh, named after the Russian mathematician Lyapunov. It's the time that it requires for the uh, uh, difference in the trajectories to grow by about a factor of three. For the solar system, it turned out that the Lyapunov time was around 10 or 20 million years. This may seem like a long time, but remember that uh, the age of the solar system is thousands of millions of years. And this means that over the length, the age of the solar system, the trajectories of the planets are simply not predictable. This doesn't mean that the orbits are wandering all over the solar system. They tend to be restricted to being more or less the same shape that they had. Most of the chaos is along the track of the planet. It, so the difficulty is in predicting exactly where Jupiter will be 100 million years from now, rather than the overall shape of its orbit. But the chaos is, is, is there, it's real. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic indication of the, uh, the importance of the chaos is that if you decide to go to the theater instead of staying home one night, the extra tidal force on Jupiter due to your decision from the motion of your body is sufficient to change the orbital position of Jupiter uh, so that it's completely unpredictable after a few hundred million years. So it, 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 in the long run, uh, this beautifully predictable solar system where we can send spacecraft to Mars or other planets, where we can predict eclipses, where we can measure uh, time by the rotation of the Earth. Um, that beautiful predictability is true only on short times, times less than 100 million years, and not true on, on long times. What does this mean for the stability of the solar system? Again, when people do the calculations, uh, the solar system stays the same until the sun dies. However, that's not guaranteed. Because the system is chaotic, you can only tell what it's going to do in a statistical sense by calculating many hundreds or thousands of solar systems with small changes in the parameters and seeing uh, what possible outcomes they sample. And it is found that in about 1% of the cases that are tried, um, the solar system has a bad end. Typically, it's because Mercury starts to grow in eccentricity and eventually falls into the sun or collides with Venus or perhaps even the Earth. So the question of whether the solar system is stable, we now realize, doesn't have a simple yes or no answer. It can only be answered statistically and statistically, the answer is uh, there's about a 99% chance that it's stable. The second consequence comes from looking in the past rather than in the future. If Mercury might be lost from the solar system, maybe we had other planets that were present in the solar system shortly after it was formed that were lost sometime between the formation of the solar system and now. One of the clues that this may have, may have happened is that if you try to place another planet uh, between, say, in the outer solar system, between Jupiter and Neptune, um, you can try building uh, imaginary solar systems with extra planets in there. And when you do that, the extra planet is always unstable. It always escapes or collides with uh, one of the giant planets. So it seems quite likely that the solar system initially had more planets, and as it grew older, some of these planets were unstable and were eventually lost from the solar system. So there's a good chance we're stable into the future, but there's a very good chance that in the past we weren't stable and we've been gradually settling into a more and more stable state, which probably will now last until the sun dies. The future of this problem is that we now have discovered many hundreds, in fact, probably thousands of planetary systems around other stars. And one of the critical questions that we don't understand the answer to yet 
is whether the properties of those systems have been shaped by the requirement that they're stable. That is, to what extent does the simple requirement that the system be stable for a few billion years, the typical age of most stars, to what extent does that constrain the properties of the planetary systems uh, that we see around other stars? To what extent can we predict the properties of other planets uh, from the requirement that their systems are stable? And to what extent can we use that as a tool for understanding uh, uh, how planets form and how they survive around other stars? Mm -hmm.